From self-made upstart to Hollywood hitmaker, Will Packer aimed at an underserved market and hit the bullseye over and over. Packer's eye for talent and commitment to authenticity have translated into nine number one films and over a billion dollars at the box office. This is his blueprint. Tell me a little bit about your parents and your home life growing up. My parents were amazing. My home life was very strong. Part of the reason that I've had whatever level of success I've had is because I had an amazing relationship with my parents. Together, my parents instilled in me, you can do anything. Like before Barack Obama, and it was cool for like black parents to tell little black kids, you can do it. You can, look at Barack, like you can be anything. Like before all that, my parents had me believing that I could fly. And I really took that to heart. And I've been trying to fly ever since. My dad was an engineer. My mom was a homemaker. So him being an engineer, is that what drew you to engineering as a major in college? Bruh, it is what made me major in engineering. It didn't draw me to it. That, okay. I never wanted to be an engineer. What it was, was he gave me uh, a strong analytical mind. I was always good in math and science. And I got a scholarship to major in electrical engineering. This was at the time, and this is still a push, but at the time they were trying to get more minorities in, in the STEM uh, majors, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And so I was very strong in math and science, had really good test scores. I wanted to go to Wharton. I was like, that's me, I'm going to Ivy League school. I am too good to be hanging out with anybody going to a public university. That's my mind, right? And I got this big scholarship to go to FAMU, Florida A&M, mm -hmm. but I had to major in engineering. And so I was like, listen, I sat my parents down. I was like, yeah, I gotta explain something to you. Uh, first of all, I don't wanna go to FAMU. Second of all, I don't wanna be an engineer. They said, third of all, guess where you going? <laughs> and so I ended up at FAMU and it was the best decision I ever made. I did not find like the bug to get involved with entertainment until my sophomore year in college when along with some of my frat brothers and, and specifically one of my line brothers who wanted to be a director. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be the next Spike Lee, Hughes Brothers, John Singleton. He had watched them. He had made like a small movie in high school and he was like, yo, I want to be a film director. I was like, I don't even know what that is. I don't know. like. Who looks like us that does that? He was like, Spike Lee. I was like, yeah, but that's like Hollywood. We're in Tallahassee, Florida, bro. What are we doing? So we make this tiny movie. We borrowed like $20,000 to make it. Borrow is not the right term. We begged for that money and they gave it to us. From, from like the like university the or family? government. Okay. Uh, the Panhellenic Council. We got the frats and sororities to kick in some money. Uh, we got local folks in the community to give us cameras and equipment. Like there's more equipment in this house than I had to shoot the movie, but we were able to borrow like one camera and a, and a sound machine. And all of the sort of filmmaking know-how is coming from your partner Rob and just what he's learned in school and you are making it up on the fly? Brother, the filmmaking know-how came from sheer energy, hustle, and passion. Rob had shot a horrible little movie when he was in high school on camcorder, but he got it done. And so he did know a little bit about that. He had been through the process, but there is literally zero film school actual formal experience or training anywhere with anybody involved. It was just, a, it was like, we wanna do it. We just willed it. We were like, we gotta figure it out. There were these books that you could buy. You could like overpay to buy these books. They were called Hollywood Creative Directories. And they had listings of all the companies in Hollywood. So we would send chocolate bars, Hershey bars, along with the movie, along with a poster and a marketing plan to all these different entities out in Hollywood with the hopes that somebody would pick up the movie. We were like, we made a movie. Like, we just were so proud of the fact that we had actually completed a full length movie. We were like, oh, this is it. Like, bye. We were telling people at FAMU, I will see you from the Oscars. Like, <laughs> I'm literally about to be rich, so you might want to be nice to me. They didn't even have the audacity to send it back. We were able to convince a second run movie theater where they were showing movies for $1.50 after they got out of the main movies. I said, give me the smallest screen, give me a showing where nobody ever comes, where you got nothing to lose. Give me that showing, let me show you what I can do. We sold out that showing like three weeks in advance. So you get the run in the second run theater. Yep. Um, and now where does, the, where does the film live after that? 
Well, that's interesting, you should ask. So, okay, remember, this is back in 94. So, the holy grail for a movie that didn't like release on thousands mm -hmm. of screens was Blockbuster Video. Remember Blockbuster oh, yeah. Video? Way before Netflix and Chill Boys and Girls, there was Blockbuster, let's make it a Blockbuster night. We cut a deal with a video distributor, a home video distributor in Hollywood, like the one out of two people that would, would distribute our film and that called us back. And we had these two deals on the table and they were both god awful. One was like, you will never ever make any money. And one was like, boy, bye. So it was like, which one of these deals do we take? So we took the boy by and it had like this Pythagorean theorem of equations that you had to go through before you saw any profits on the movie, but they were going to distribute it. They got it. They put together like glossy looking box art for the film and they actually got it distributed in video stores around the country, including Blockbuster. We then used that to go out and tell people, we're real filmmakers. We're on the shelves at Blockbuster. They go, you're on the shelves at Blockbuster? Yeah, go look in the blah, blah, blah section, Chocolate City and we got a couple copies in there. And that kind of gave us a little bit of legitimacy when it was time to move on and try to raise money for future films. Did the, the Chocolate City film end up being profitable when all was said and done? We actually brought in about a hundred grand with that movie when it was all said and done. Huge. Yeah, for two kids in college, Listen, that's a... I thought it was over, Noah. I literally, I was like, oh, this is it. Like, I was calling my mom. I don't know where I'm gonna live next. South of France, Italy, <laughs> Africa, I'm out. I always was a go-getter. Like, I just, I never was the guy that wasn't gonna work hard. Like, whatever it was I was doing, you know, if I was the, the garbage man, I'm gonna try to be the best garbage man. It's just a competitive drive in me. And it was an expectation my parents set very early in me um, that, you can be the best, so why not be the best? Do you immediately form Rainforest at that point, or? Rainforest was something we started while we were still in college. That was Rob and I's company to continue making Chocolate City style movies. We were like, we did it once, we'll do it again. We started it before we graduated. So you graduate, and what is the next step for the two of you? The choice was, do we move to New York, or do we move to LA? because that's where the film productions companies were, that's where the work was. And we talked about it and thought about it and we said, you know what? We're gonna be the smallest fish ever in those huge ponds. But Atlanta, which we knew a little bit about, the music scene was really just starting to pop when we graduated. We graduated in 96. We said, you know what? We could be a big fish in a smaller pond in Atlanta because you got all these people doing music, we can come in and move to that market. Even before we get the film thing really going, at least we can do music videos. It's genius. So we moved to Atlanta. Ask me how many music videos we got to shoot after moving to Atlanta. How many music videos? Zero, sir. Not <laughs> one. It was so locked up, so tight, and everybody knew each other, and we were the outsiders, and they weren't about to like give us a budget to shoot the new you know, Monica video. So fortunately, God put us in a place where we were you know, two broke kids, graduated from college with engineering degrees, sitting on a shelf, needing to make some money. So we said, let's do independent film full time. Sometimes when stuff is tough, and I don't know how I'm gonna figure out how you know I'm gonna get that actor in the movie, how I'm gonna get that extra money for the budget I need, or how I'm gonna open the movie because things aren't going right with the marketing campaign. I'll come and I'll look at this wall and it'll remind me that I am enough, that I can do it. Because look at what I've done, you know? This is my I am enough room, you know? And everybody needs that. Everybody needs that place they can go to, even if it's just like your bathroom mirror where you look at yourself. Everybody needs that place where they can tell themselves you are enough. That's what this is for me. Having scored with a niche audience, Packer looked for another open lane and found one. With this refined strategy, he and partner Rob created a slate of projects that demanded Hollywood's attention. With Chocolate City, you made a film that was about sort of loosely your experience or the experience that you were having in college at the time. That's right. Your next film is an erotic thriller. <laughs> yes. How does one arrive <laughs> upon the idea that, yes, this is what we're gonna do for our next movie? We saw that making movies for our niche audience in college worked very well. It was the same approach with Twa. We were gonna make a movie for a niche audience that hadn't seen themselves on screen in those situations, and that's what we did. How does one start raising money for a film, you know, in their mid-20s in a city that they don't really know any, anyone? Hardest thing to do ever, hard. 
super hard. Raising money at any level in your career is very difficult. At the beginning of your career, it, it is never harder. So it was tough. Uh, it meant knocking on a lot of doors and getting told no a lot. And we always thought like the budget of the film would be, you know, like um, $500,000. But what we did after trying so hard to raise that 500,000, we said, okay, we're gonna set a date not a financial goal, an actual calendar goal. So, and, so rather than say like, this is gonna cost us 100,000 to shoot, you just said, whatever we have, May 31st. You we're got going. it, okay. that's the budget of the movie. It was in the summer, it was 200,000. That's how much we had raised, it was like maybe August, it was late summer, cause then we shot the movie in the fall. And that's what we got our hands on. And we said, if we don't, we'll be raising money forever. We'll, we may never get to 500,000. So let's take what we got and let's go and roll. And that's what we did. I thought, okay, this next one, this is the one that's gonna take us, you know, mainstream, global box office. Like, I didn't even know what all that really meant, but I thought this film could be big. And I approached it as such. And in a way it was, it wasn't global box office big, but for a niche movie that we shot for 200 grand, it actually was pretty big. Yeah, you made six or eight times the investment, yep. which is a total win, right? That's right, absolutely. How do you get from there to inking the deal with Sony? Sony saw us, because they keep track of all this. It's like they got box office charts now. They had them back then, it just wasn't online. And so Sony was paying attention and seeing this little movie, Choice, made by Rainforest Films, and the guy calls me from Sony, and we were in our three bedroom uh, which was the worldwide headquarters of Rainforest at the time. Mm -hmm. I answered the phone, the guy goes, this is blah, 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 I'm head of distribution at Sony Pictures, I need to speak to somebody with Rainforest about this movie, Choice. And I go, well, you wanna speak to Will Packer? And he said, okay, was Mr. Packer there? I said, hold please. I put him <laughs> on, I go, Rob, Sony's on the phone. Sony's on the phone right now, and they're asking about Twa. He goes, well, what are you gonna do? I said, I don't know. I got back on the phone, I said, Mr. Packer's unavailable, but I'll have him call you back, give me your number. <laughs> we ended up cutting a deal with Sony for the ancillary rights to Twa, and then we had a relationship. We pitched him like five other movies. They said no to all of them. And then they said, but what about a Twa 2? We said, yes, fine, we'll do it. Because we were broke again at that point. We do Twa 1, Twa 2, Twa 3. At that time, we are the number one African-American erotic thriller producers in the world, which is to say we're the only African-American erotic thriller producers in the world. But we make that third one, we convince them to call it something else. So then we had Emotives, had Emotives 2, had Emotives 3, and then we did a Twa 3. So that was all we could get green light. Right then we were pigeonholed, that's what they allowed us to do. You know, you're, you're on this sort of loop with Sony for a while. Yes. Where they're only letting you make one type of film. Now, I imagine you guys are doing pretty well and starting to have some money in your pocket, so that's good, but your ambitions are to grow the brand and to be much bigger. Yep. So, you know, are you strategizing on how to sort of break yourself out of that cycle? Well, I think that what we were trying to do, we were stuck and pigeonholed making those erotic movies, but we were trying to figure out, while those are good and they're keeping the lights on, how do we creatively pitch something to them that they will fund? How can we change our pitch, adjust our approach? My mom was the impetus for this. She said, I'm so proud of you, baby. You're doing good. You're chasing this film thing. I, I didn't know it would be successful, but all your movies are nasty. This is my mom talking. All your movies are nasty. I can't take my missionary sisters at the church <laughs> to go see any of your movies. I said, okay, mom, I got you. And that's what led us to the gospel because the faith-based market, especially the black faith-based market was big and robust. And we convinced them to take a chance on that. And interestingly enough, it was the first movie that Idris Elba was in after he came off the wire. And so it was Idris and it was Boris Kojo and, uh, and Nona Gay, great cast. And we shot this small movie. It was uh, set in the church. I had every gospel artist that was out in the time at the time in the movie or on the soundtrack. And we released it, we shot it for like five million, ended up making like 12 to 15 million. 
And, um, and so that was my first time I had Sony theatrically distribute the film. And after that, I caught the eye of Screen Gems and now we were off to the races. What happened after that, after the gospel, then we did Stomp the Yard, which was based, Stomp the Yard was really kind of like Chocolate City 2.0. And that was still part of that original still deal? Still part of Sony, that's okay. right, yes. And that, that was a, a major inflection point in your career. That was the big movie for us. Like literally, that's the one that I started getting the calls, you know, and I got my calls returned and I could get meetings because the movie opened number one. 60 million when all was said and done? 12 million dollars to make it. I thought it was 75, Noah. Don't show up my numbers, bro. Is I it? Mean, what was it? Was it 60? It, I, I saw 61 on Wiki. So. All right, go with that. Go with that. Uh, it was. It was. It, it might not have been a worldwide number. It was five times. Well, back then, I don't know that our our, our international grosses <laughs> were where they needed to be, but it made a little money internationally. Yeah, but it was number one two weeks in a row. It's crazy. So how does your life change? It still put us in a position where, you know, we're still, you know, making any movie is hard and it wasn't like we had a bunch of successes, we had one. But that one led to another and another. And so we were still at Screen Gems, a division of Sony, okay. after Stomp the Yard, you know, Takers, um, Obsessed, This Christmas. Now that the, the, the door is open and you have more opportunity and more options, yeah. I'm sure that the scripts that are coming to you are now much more diverse. Um, the people who are willing to work with you on the acting side and on the directing side, also more diverse. How are you making the creative choices on what projects you want to take on? Following my instincts, really. That is, you know, I, uh, I had at that point just enough confidence to feel like I didn't know everything about what I was doing, but enough to know that I knew a little bit and I should follow my instincts about the types of movies that I should and shouldn't make. And, uh, and those instincts led me to some very successful projects. And they were always around content that either nobody else was making or they weren't making it the way that we were making it with the type of actors and the type of story that we would tell around certain themes. And, and what specifically? Like so for instance, like um, Obsessed. Obsessed is, you know, it's a thriller and it's a, a, a woman coming after a guy's, a, a wom another woman's husband. That is, it's a derivative idea. It's not an idea that you've never seen before, but you hadn't seen that before where there was a black couple with a white woman coming after the husband. And by the way, it didn't hurt that Beyonce was the wife, but even with Takers, Takers was a multiracial cast, a heist movie where all the guys wore suits all the time. That was Idris and T.I. and Paul Walker, mm -hmm. God bless them, and Hayden Christensen, Matt Dillon. And so you hadn't seen that kind of very diverse heist crew at that time. When I look at your career, it's sort of like a hyperbolic curve, right? You start getting a few hits, 2007, 2008, 2009, and then 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, it's like 100 million or nothing. <laughs> you know, clearly you're learning along the way and sort of refining the process by which you're selecting, you know, scripts, Absolutely. selecting cast. That's right. What is that magic formula now? I don't know that there's a magic formula, man. I'm gonna be honest. If I did, I wouldn't tell you. But, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it really is going back to the same thing that worked when I was a college student making my first movie. And that was make something that an audience, Maybe not every audience, but an audience finds authentic. An audience finds it to be relatable and says, that's my story, or that's a story I wanna be a part of, I wanna own it, and make it good enough that then people outside of that core audience will also come. I don't know that I ever imagined that I'd have a movie theater in my house, honestly. This is a room that when we were we were designing it, my wife was like, I want this to be a room that you come in and sit down and feel proud of. And so it's so cool because I don't have enough room on the walls to put up all my movies. What is the moment that brings you the most satisfaction? When it's out, period. Like, without a doubt, when the movie is when I'm, I'm standing in front of the audience at the premiere or a special screening, I'm introducing it, introducing what we've worked so hard on along with my director and we're saying, here it is, ladies and gentlemen, and you sit back and watch them respond to the movie. There's no greater feeling in the world as a creator to have people enjoy what you have created. As the hits piled up, Packer's finger remained firmly on the pulse of the multicultural audience. 
Yet each new success was regarded as a surprise by media and industry pundits. Pretty much at the zenith of Rainforest success, 2012, 2013, you decide to dissolve the company mm -hmm. and your you know, partnership with Rob. What happened? It had been for a while uh, coming where Rob was, was directing television and I was producing films that he wasn't directing. And so while we were still very close, and to this day we're close, it wasn't like, you know, a bad breakup. Like this is a guy who's my line brother and we went to college together, we'll be friends forever. But from the business standpoint, and this is something that I try to tell people all the time, you have to be able to separate business from personal. Our personal relationship was amazing and made all the sense in the world. The business relationship stopped making sense because I was producing projects that he wasn't involved with and he was directing projects that I wasn't involved with. So we were kind of just holding on to that college dream of you'll direct and I'll produce and we'll do everything together. And that's not how our paths went in the industry. So it made sense to say, listen, you continue to do your thing under your own business, I'll do mine under my own business, and we'll figure out ways to continue to work together when it makes sense. But when you look at people who have been very successful in business, they have been able to pivot, to change, to be malleable, and to make decisions that may run averse to their personal feelings for the good of the business. One of the hallmarks of your career has been your ability to find talent. What is the thread that, you know, the first time you see an Idris Elba or Kevin Hart, Yeah. What, what is it that about them that you're instantly like, this is the person I'm gonna make a big gamble on? You know what, it's, it helps that I live outside of LA. I'm there all the time, fly back and forth, cross the country, all the time. But we're sitting in Atlanta, this is home. It makes me interact with people who aren't in the bubble. I first realized how amazing, popular, and talented Idris Elba was because women outside of Hollywood were watching The Wire, not a show that particularly spoke to women, but they would watch for him, for his Stringer Bell character. I was able to hear that, being around those types of people, and I said, this guy is ready to go to the next level. Same thing with Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart was somebody that he was making way more noise outside of Hollywood than he was in. Hollywood had this perception of Kevin Hart like, yeah, he's a supporting actor that's been around for a while. He tried to have his leading man moment. Soul Plane bombed. His sitcom bombed. He's not a leading man. He's a great supporting actor. Whereas in real America, people were watching Kevin Hart videos on YouTube, on bootleg, over and over again. My son and his friends, they were watching Kevin Hart videos over and over. I was like, what? When did Kevin Hart become a thing? They were like, bro, you late. Like, he's, you know, this was like one of his early stand up specials that, you know, was super hot in the barbershops. Well, that meant that you didn't have numbers that Hollywood could see to say, oh, look at somebody that's rising up the charts. Uh, so that, it's really about making sure I have my finger on the pulse of real people. So you were involved in Straight Outta Compton as an executive producer. Yeah. What do you think is the most important thing that went right with that? And why are so many other rap biopics so terrible? I think that with Straight Outta Compton, it was one thing people don't realize is how long that project was in the making. And of course Cube and Dre and F. Gary Gray were involved for years, 10 plus years, with trying to get that movie to the big screen. There were iteration after iteration, script after script, other distributors were involved. I didn't become involved until it came to Universal, which was its final stop. One of the major reasons that story worked was F. Gary Gray. I give him so much love around that movie because it was a story he was born to tell, and sometimes that happens with a filmmaker. And it was a world that he know and a world that he was from. And so he told it with that kind of passion and heart, but he also is a commercial filmmaker. He understands how to tell a story in an amazingly gripping way. All of that lent to the success of that story. This summer, Girls Trip comes out and debuts number one with 30 million, yeah. which... 31.2, it's not like we're counting, I'm just yeah. saying it's 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, whatever, but okay. I understand, go ahead. Fair, but so, so you make $30 million off yeah. of this film, and all of the write-ups that I saw in the media were like of surprise. Like they're every shocked. Time. They're shocked. No, they say that every how time about my is movies. it that in 2017 oh, man, people please. are still shocked? Yeah. 
Well, because you don't have a lot of them, right? I mean, look, you know, this was one of the things I pitched when I pitched a movie. I said, there's never been an R rated female comedy with black women at the center. Like, how do we not jump on that? Like, even if we do the bad version, we'll be the only one and people will go just because of that. So, I think that there still is that element of surprise. And by the way, I've been very fortunate. I've got, you know, like nine number one movies. And I think that it will change over time as the expectation becomes that this is more the rule and not the exception. So the exception now is when um, a Tom Cruise movie opens and doesn't do big numbers. That's the exception because for so long, Tom Cruise movies or movies with just white dudes have been huge. But you haven't had a lot of movies with black people in front of the camera that have come out and opened successfully. So there still is kind of a, I don't know how big the audience could be for that or what it might do. It will change and it will change as more and more of these movies are made and as the audience continues to support those movies. But in the interim, I'm having fun playing the underdog role. I'll take it. There has been such a dearth for so long of black filmmakers, of just filmmakers of color in general. And so we have so far to go. There's not a lot of Will Packers. There's not a lot of producers like me that make the content that I make. And it takes time. It takes me being able to bring people up. It takes other people to be able to get their stories told and get in front of studios who will make their movies. But my success benefits them in the same way that I wouldn't be here if there wasn't a Spike Lee or the Hudlin brothers, you know, or other filmmakers that had successful movies starring actors of color. I need that so when I come in, Hollywood, it's a reactive industry. It's not proactive, it's reactive. What has already worked, okay, that's what we wanna do. So the fact that I'm making movies like this that work, it'll make it easier for somebody else to come in, but it takes time, we're not there yet. Do you think that we will get to a place in Hollywood in the not too distant future where you're able to make a, a film with a $100 million budget around people of color? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's happening right now. The, the blackest movie uh, ever made is Black Panther. I mean, there's nothing blacker. It's black. It's Black Panther. Everybody is black. Like, you know, so uh, and I love it. I love what it's going to do. Obviously, that's Marvel. So it's based on tremendously successful IP. But when that movie works, and I'm already claiming it for my say, man Ryan Coogler. Is there a lot riding on that? There absolutely is, no question. I mean, if that movie were not to work, because you know the Marvel movies generally work, if that movie were not to work, there will be one area that you point at, and that will be the blackness of the movie. And did non-black audiences go see it? Did worldwide audiences go see it? And if not, it's gonna be tough to do that again. The films you've made and the success that you've enjoyed has changed the way that race in America is framed in many ways. Wow, that's huge, that's a big statement. How do you feel about that? I, it, it, tremendous, I mean, you know, sometimes you have to take a step back and look and go, wow, I really have made 20 plus films and this much money at the box office, because when you're in it, you can't sit up and look around and you can't be in your rearview mirror if you're driving forward, you kinda gotta be focused and going. Um, but sometimes I do take a step back and look at what I've accomplished and the impact of what I've accomplished and how I've been able to affect other people's careers and people that I remember interning for me that are now you know, directing their own films and that's a really, really good feeling. You've achieved enormous success over the last two decades. Yep. First of all, is there any ceiling to that, do you think? Like, are, are you just, is there any place where you would check out? No matter how successful I am, it's great to have a number one movie. It's great to have a big box office. But ultimately, when I leave this earth, it's my legacy that's gonna matter, right? They, it's not a bunch of stats. It's gonna be, well, how were his kids? Who did, whose lives did he touch? Who did he mentor? Who did he bring along? I wanna, I wanna leave this earth with people saying that he affected other people. You know, he, yes, he was a successful whatever, but it was what he did, the way he touched other people's lives. That's what we will remember and that's what he left behind.